Okay, here we go. The last of the sections on not producing the dupe. We're going to go through an explicit example, page rank, which is a little more complicated than the earlier ones. And it is a very famous application. Because it essentially was the reason why Google became world dominant. It's no longer so important to Google, but uh, in times gone by it was important. And this comes from Judy Chu's uh, computing course material. And let's go. So, as it says, this was the early stages of Google. Page refers to Page, the found one of the founders of, of um, Google, probably presumably was in his uh, PhD thesis. And it's a very critical algorithm because it allowed us to rank web pages. This is what allowed Google from the beginning to be able to um, return a much better source of uh, sorting of the web pages because he had a very much more robust approach for finding out which web pages were the ones people were most likely to want. And we will look at the algorithm. And as there are an enormous number of websites, it's an iterative algorithm. You start off with a value for the page rank, and then you um, iterate it to find the final value. Um, it actually is a very nifty example of machine learning, because in the heart of the page rank is actually uh, matrix matrix multiplication, or sorry, matrix vector multiplication. Because it's using the so-called par, par method to find the leading eigenvector of um, matrix. All right, so it's linear, iterative linear algebra, and that's what machine learning is. And this is effectively an early insight into parallel machine learning. Okay, here we have the page run computation. And here we have a site I. And what we want to know is who points to I. So J is a site which has an outlink pointing to I. Not the ones that I points to, the ones that point to I. Because what makes a page important is if other people come to it. And you will come to it if you go to a web page and that web page points at I. So we can intuitively understand these things here. D is a fudge factor. 0.85, I'm probably not very sensitive exactly what it is. It shouldn't be one. Um, and the this this here is the page rank of a, a site J, which points to I. L of PJ is the number of sites that J points to. And so this is then the probability that if there was a person sitting at page J, and they randomly, they took all the outlinks from J. This is the probability that they would actually uh, go to site I. So this is the sum of those probabilities. Um, this thing here is a constant. So what the, the interpretation is very simple. That here we are on I. We and sorry, we're we're on J, and on J, and we have a certain probability. We, we go to. Uh, we, we now make a step in time. We go to a site at different sites. We have a probability one minus d over the total number of sites, namely in this case 15%. We would just go to any site independent of what j is. We would just go up into the top of our Google um, uh, search engine and type a totally new URL which comes into our head. That's one minus d over n. This thing here. Is the remaining probability where we're just assuming we shut our eyes and click on one of the outlinks of J at random. <coughs> so it's an interesting equation. We have page rank on both sides. And if we think of this as actually evolving in time, here we have all these walkers. Billions and billions, hundreds of billions of walkers walking around the web. And there's some of them are on the site J and they walk to new sites. This tells you how many the, how many walkers there'll be at each site after this step, and the idea is that uh, this process will converge in terms of fractions of well, walkers at each site. So if you run this a hundred times, a hundred times at the end of a hundred steps, you will have got a good approximation to the total number of walkers on every site, 
And that's what you're, that's then the page rank. The relative number of walkers on every side is the page rank. So we can either think of this as a mathematically iterative algorithm, or we can think of it as sort of mechanically, as actual people running around the web, moving according to some Newton's law of the web, which says you move in, a, in time delta t, you move to a new site with these different probabilities. Okay, here is an example, and uh, here we have a site B with lots of people talking, pointing to it. We have a site A with just one person talking to it. Um, D is a little more. Um, so D is um, got two people speaking. It's got one person who's quite important talking to it because he has lots of sites talking to it. Uh, C is important because it actually is pointed to by B, and B is important. So this comes from Wikipedia, which has, of course, like it has so many things, a much better discussion than we do at PageRank, because it's uh, sitting there mathematically, and it's being tweaked by, by the community. Um, so, of course, this um, make, makes quantitative the obvious um, intuitive idea that uh, some sites are much more important than other sites. And if you were doing a search, you prefer to get the results from stanford.edu than joeschmo.com. And of course, these links, and another way of thinking of these links is as votes, not as paths where you're just stumbling around in the wood and you take each path at random. And well, uh, this, this, this statement here just says in words what I put in the equation and said, and, and I also said in words. So that's again saying the same thing, that page P has various in-links, the ones people who, are lit, who have a URL on their site, an in-link is if J has a URL on its side which points to I. Then J is an in-link to I. And if you want to be important on the web, you want to have in-links from important sites. So you need to get iu.edu to point at you. Which um, maybe it actually does for many people. Uh, but uh, it's even better if, uh, if uh, Amazon.com points at you and things like that. All right, so um, here is a very simple example of uh, three sites, which happen to be called Yahoo, Amazon, and Microsoft. And we have actually two-way links. Uh, Amazon has a link on it talking to Yahoo, and Yahoo has a link talking to Amazon. Notice those, those links, this is not symmetric. Those links are independent. Because it really matters who is talking. Well, the outlink and the inlink are very different. Uh, you are not made more important by having lots of outlinks. That just says it's, <coughs> it's like a desert island. You can have lots of um, <coughs> launching sites where you can take your canoe and go to other islands. But the key question is, do you have a boat stopping at that desert island? And the bigger the boat, the better. You'll get more customers. So the boat is the link from the big site to the little site. So these are the mathematical equations. Notice there are three equations, and there are three unknowns. And we know that won't give you a solution, except if we add the y plus a plus m equals one, we have a solution, which is y of two fifths, a of two fifths, and m of one fifth. Uh, Microsoft is probably more important than Yahoo, but never mind. It was just an example. Now we could so this is a three by three. Um, well, these are three by three equations. Or four by three, I mean, depending on how you look at it. And um, no, that's three by three. And so you can use the world's simplest matrix inversion code, what I could call Gaussian Riven. Actually, of course, you do it by hand, by adding or subtracting equations, and you'll get this answer. Or else you can use, um, so, but you can use standard matrix um, in, uh, inversion technology or linear equation solver technology to get this answer. 
So if we want to make this, well, we want to pose this as a problem, we introduce a matrix, which is the uh, uh, if page J has n out things, then Mij is 1 over n. Otherwise, Mij equals 0. Then every column sums to 1. That's for, for um, each. So if we sum, oh, we take the column J, the sum of the elements in that column are 1. And um, if R is the page rank vector, which we all will assume is normalized to 1, because that's a free assumption, because we can have R on one side and R on the other side, so we can assume it's normalized to 1. Then the flow equations is that R equals M times R. And if you know anything about linear algebra, it tells you immediately that R is an eigenvector of M with eigenvalue 1. And it turns out that M has an eigenvector of 1. And also has an eigenvector of 1 if you add in this, uh, this fudge factor, the 0.85 factor and the 0.15 factor. And it always has an eigenvector of 1, that is the largest, sorry, an eigenvalue 1, that is the largest eigenvalue. And you need to find the largest eigenvalue of the matrix M, or matrix M with the 0.85 and 0.15 added. <coughs> Notice, N is big, 1.8 billion, or 1.86 billion, I should say. So we can't use simple methods. Also, we better be careful about the zeros. Because 1.86 billion by 1.86 billion is a lot of numbers. We don't want to store nearly all of which are zero. Because any one website has a negligible number compared to 1.8 billion, a negligible number of, um, of um, outlinks. So, this is a very good example of why we like iterative methods. Because iter whereas when you do, if you, did, if you actually sat down and did Gaussian elimination on this problem, you will find that each iteration, the zeros will get overwritten by non-zeros, and your matrix will start to fill up. Alternatively, you use so-called iterative method, that is not true. The zeros will remain unchanged, because you, you always are iterating with the matrix M, not the matrix N with with fancy things done to it from the by uh, LU decomposition. And it also is quite straightforward to parallelize it. So we'll always use an iterative method for this problem. And I'm sure that's what Google used. And so Google used, or pay, uh, Page used the uh, iterative method to do page rank. And they made a few billion dollars each. Not bad for an iterative method. Good. So here is M for the Yahoo example. Uh, we have uh, YAM equals YAM, and then we have this matrix here, half, half, zero, half, zero, one, not half, zero. And then we have the damping factor, which is this one minus D factor of N of the front. It says, I point out that does not change the fact that we're looking for eigenvectors of eigenvalue one. And here is the intuitive interpretation of this, which I've already recorded. Uh, you either sit on a web page and go and for one for um, for for fraction d of the time, you uh, you choose one of the n available pages. For fraction one minus d of the time, you choose one of the outlinks. And so that's. This is just what I originally gave this interpretation. All right, so if we actually hear some, this comes from a group at Stanford who wrote out the iterative method sequentially. I make some comments at the end of these uh, slides from, uh, from outside about the um, non iterative method. So you start off by saying every web page is equally important, 1 over n, because they have to sum up to 1. Then you iterate this equation here, where m is the basic matrix with the 1 minus d factor added in. And there is a theory of random walks, which are Markov processes, which says that from decent graphs, 
this will always, there will always be an answer which will always be an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. And you will get to that in, if you iterate this equation, which just means the walk is just, remember iteration is just walking. We have these walkers running around the websites. And we need to have more walkers than websites so we can actually think of the probability as the number of walkers at the site. So we have lots and lots of walkers. So at the end, you know, an important site like Amazon.com, we have lots of walkers. And an unimportant site, is a website like me. Me.org will not have many markers. So, and the theory says that you'll get this whatever starting location says. And that says you have a set of walkers, you put them in any way across the web. If they start walking according to these rules, they'll always end up with the same probability distribution. And here is the, uh, they're using uh, beta not D and um, this again, I stress that M is a sparse matrix. And whereas we would have N squared entry for a full matrix, we only have 10 N entries if there are 10 links per node. And we just run it, calculate it's R new equals beta M R old. Well, this is actually the result without the one minus beta term. But just mother, you can think of that as modifying the um, matrix M. So you always store these matrices in sparse matrix fashion, which says that you say, here's my here's my column. I will store um, for every matrix item, but I will store the row number, the column number, and the value. And for each, um, say, <coughs> for each um, source node, I will uh, store the destination node. I will store the list of destination, number of destination nodes, which is if you think the degree of the node, and the values of those destination nodes. That's all I have to do. This defines the matrix. The matrix has to be divided by n. Added in the one minus beta and beta term, that's it. Um, but they note that uh, for 10 links per website, which I don't know how accurate that is, uh, that's 40 gigabytes, which in, when these notes were written was a big number now. Many, many uh, computers will have 40 gigabytes of main memory. But anyway, we're going to run this in parallel, so it doesn't matter. And when we run it in parallel, we're going to distribute the matrix. So each, uh, if you have a thousand uh, nodes in your parallel algorithm, you're going to store one thousandth of the matrix elements on each node. So every you just uh, iterate this thing, uh, you can use a do to do this, writing it out to disk, and then you calculate the difference of the norm between the old, the new value of the Rank matrix, rank vector versus the old, and you just test on that difference and stop when it's a uh, small enough, 10 to the minus 6 or whatever the difference you want. Um, so, this particular algorithm here <coughs> is probably not the best for the parallel case because it focuses on the um, looking at destination nodes. Whereas um, I think it's better to do the opposite. Um, it depends whether you think of this by rows or by columns. And um, so the trouble is here, you see, this take calculates the destination of J, J for lots of J. We're fixing I and we're looking at all the J's it contributes to. But that's the wrong way to do it. It's much better to think of I and calculate the contributions to I. That's the so-called owner computer rule. When you are doing something, the person, the computer that does it is the one that owns the data. And it's not correct to make the computer that owns I do a calculation for J. So this is mad. sequentially on a without parallel computing, it makes no difference. But with parallel computing, it makes a big difference. You will find this algorithm is pretty inefficient. But it's perfectly good sequential algorithm. And here are these comments on the uh, 
part of page rank algorithm, which they, they say that there are many ways of doing it corresponding to taking that matrix and decomposing it over the, par the uh, parallel maps in different ways. So that corresponds to partitioning the, the data in different ways. Again, this is an example of how it's not possible to automate it. You need to have a little de deep understanding of parallel computing. They're not the best way to do this. Very hard to automate these decisions. You can always build in the right decision, but that's sort of cheating. But to get a computer to know the right decision, whereas an experienced person on parallel computing would sort of know it in 10 seconds because they've done so many such problems, very hard. So here I've written out the only compute rule, which is that uh, the core, each core owns a certain set of websites, certain number of websites. Probably you want the sum over, over indings to over those sites to be roughly constant over the cores, because the amount of work goes like uh, each 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 um, each. Um, Website stored on that node, you need to know and calculate all the inlinks to that node. And so you just use that to calculate the page rank. Now, this is a bit messy because if you want to calculate the page rank of I, you need to know the page rank of J. So you have to do a communication which sends to the Core owning i, the value of the uh, page rank of any j that it's on. Now we're actually going to do it even more complicated because every core remains 1.8 billion. So we're going to put, um, I don't know, a million websites on each of um, uh, 18,000 cores or something like that. So there's going to be a huge number of um, websites on every core. You have to send to that core all the websites it might need. Sometimes, especially if the number of cores is not too big, you can actually do this by a simple broadcast. Because although it's, it's very hard work to send the right um, page ranks to every core, that's, that requires a slightly subtle calculation. It is actually only has to be done once, and then you can be reused every iteration. Uh, but an even simpler algorithm is to broadcast all the page ranks to all nodes, and then each node just throws away the page ranks it doesn't want. 1.8 billion is not such a big number. You can't actually just store 1.8 billion uh, page ranks on every node in a perfectly satisfactory fashion. So that is the <coughs> that broadcast method is probably the simplest way of doing um, parallel computing for this problem. Okay, so you will be given a, the Docker version of this is uh, Hungary's um, signature, and you will then uh, run the page rank, and it will once this image has a dupe built into it, and the dupe will start, and then you will be able to inspect it with the Docker Bash shell. And you will go to cloud mesh slash page rank. And here's a typical answer you should see. And it's meant to take um, not so long. This is a sequential code, I believe. Good challenge for you is to write the parallel code. Pretty non pretty non-trivial. Of course, you also have to get the list of, I mean, even getting the list of, of course, you don't nobody has the list of 1.8 million websites with all their um, with all their inlinks, um, well, maybe maybe Google does, but I don't think I do. <coughs> so we, we have to run test cases. I only run a big one. Remember, parallel computing is only important for big problems. So you need thousands, tens of thousands, millions of websites before you can usefully do parallel computing. And um, you can look at the answer from this Docker job. Okay, that's the end of the Hadoop slides. I hope you, uh, actually it's pretty important though Hadoop, because I say 75% of all jobs in the world use Hadoop or could use Hadoop. 
Now they're not using a dupe, they're going to use Spark, which is the next thing we're going to do. Between them, Spark and a dupe cover nearly all applications. And if they don't cover all possible applications in the world, they cover the applications that people want to do. It's a really important difference. I once uh, stressed that in some of my early work on parallel computing. You do not have to show that all jobs can be parallelized. You can have to show that all important jobs can be parallelized. And that second thing is much easier. So we need to show that all important jobs can use Spark or Hadoop. And that's a lot easier than showing all jobs can be using Hadoop and Spark. All right, have a great time. Thank you very much.